Yeah, honestly, it makes me feel like we're losing as an industry. Like, I just think, you know, the there's a rule that I stick by, which is like complexity equals insecurity. And um, I think things today are so complex. Have you ever had to disclose a critical security vulnerability to thousands of the largest companies in the world? How about to a couple dozen governments? Doing one disclosure can sometimes be a pain, but doing thousands, having just done it, let me just say is a huge pain in the ass. 4,500 of the 1 million most popular websites accidentally exposed their backend source code, which contained passwords and API keys ranging from AWS root keys, GitHub tokens with write permissions, and SSL private certificates. A small team of researchers, myself, Hack Luke, who I'll let introduce himself. I'm uh, Hack Luke. I'm the founder of HackSec and Hacker Content. And Joe Leon discovered these keys and took on the onerous task of trying to notify all these website owners. And then we did a blog post about it. What is a .git directory and what is its intended purpose? Okay, so when you create a code repository, you basically create this directory called .git.git, and it's a folder where Git stores all of the commit history for that repository. So it contains all of the source code files within it. It's a very important directory, and it contains a, a lot of information about the application. Let me show you what he's talking about. I'm going to create a new repository and all of a sudden under the hood, a new folder gets created. This folder kind of stores all the plumbing that Git needs to both push and pull to the remote repository, as well as managing all the history for the source code that you're working on. Now imagine a situation where I just copy all of the files and folders in my current working directory into a web server. If I'm not careful, this hidden folder may accidentally end up getting served along next to all the files that I want served to my users. What's kind of wild is this vulnerability isn't actually new. How long has this vulnerability been around? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly, but definitely over a decade. 10 years ago, someone named Adam gave a talk just like this at DEF CON showing shockingly similar results. The main difference between 10 years ago and now though is how far the industry has moved to cloud. So, so many more cloud credentials ended up leaking out, which can be a lot more dangerous than what was originally discovered 10 years ago. Like what, what's the damage potential for one of these keys? I think a lot of people who are hacking today see remote code execution as like the ultimate bug. Getting cloud keys, especially root keys, is like a whole other level of bad. And uh, the reason that that is, is because if you have the root AWS, for example, AWS keys, you can log in to, you can essentially log into their cloud account and create instances, delete instances of, of, of you know, servers, um, databases, uh, you know, microservices, whatever it is, you can, you can do absolutely anything to any of them. Now you might be wondering how many of those root credentials did we actually discover? Well, AWS keys represented the second most popular key leaked out and about 17% of them were root keys. That is an insane finding and certainly not one that we were expecting. Another thing that was surprising is when we scan source code, usually AWS keys and Google Cloud keys are the most popular key types that we find. But in this case, the number one most popular key was a Git credential, a Git credential that had read and write permissions to the repository. Yeah, so there's a there's a file called config, <laughs> and um, it contains uh, some of the details about uh, where the code will be um, pushed to. But if you're lucky, it also contains plain text credentials. Let me explain what's going on here. Going back to our earlier example about initializing a new Git repository, let's say we define a remote where we can push our code to. When we define our remote, one way to authenticate to that remote is with an API key or with a password. And so if we run the command git remote add, 
and then a URL that contains a password in it, that password or API key will then get saved inside the .git folder. That's why you don't have to type the password every time you run the push command. You've probably had that happen to you before where you were using password-based authentication and you only had to give it the password once and it didn't keep reprompting it. That's because that password got saved in the config file in the hidden .git directory. What's wild is that config file never actually gets checked into revision control. It never lands on GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab. So if we scan for secrets on GitHub, for example, we're not gonna discover that particular password even though that password can still leak out in things like artifacts, Docker containers, and in this case, a web server. Imagine all the chaos that an attacker could cause if they had write permissions to your GitHub. And what we found was about 67% of the GitHub tokens had admin privileges. They could manipulate, delete, push malicious code, add users, do just about anything you can imagine to all of the repositories that they had access to. And many of the keys had access to more than just the one repository that they were found inside of. Another shocker is we found the SSL private key for one of these websites inside their .git directory. And that's particularly an issue because of how difficult those private keys are to actually rotate. In fact, if you try to revoke it, a lot of times devices won't necessarily recognize that that certificate has been revoked and it turns into this whole painful process that really no one ever wants to have to deal with. What an attacker can do with this private key is they can forge the data that's coming from this website and they can make an end user either send the attacker data that the website should only be the one seeing or they can send malicious data to that user like malware and other things that they might not be expecting. Okay, so how did we notify over 4,000 websites that they had exposed their source code? Well, inside the .git directory includes all of the commit history information, which also includes the email address of who authored which commits. So we pulled all of those email addresses and emailed all of those authors saying, hey, your code ended up leaking out. Uh, some people were appreciative, but the vast majority either didn't see the email or didn't respond to us despite following up with them a couple times. It's kind of like finding someone's wallet on the street and opening it up to take out their ID and try to figure out who they are so that you can get the wallet back to them. Okay, so how are these things leaking out in the first place? Well, let's start with the PHP and the JSP web frameworks. Both web frameworks are designed to function kind of the same way where they operate just like file systems. So you have a collection of PHP files or a collection of JSP files in a folder, and then you serve them with a web server that's designed to just return any file in that folder back to the end user. And anything that's not a PHP or a JSP file will just get returned back to the user as is without any execution or rendering. So if you have a URL that's like example.com slash index.php, that index.php is staved in the folder. And if you have a .git directory in the same folder, someone could go out of their way to access slash .git and it would just get served by the web server. This contrasts with modern web frameworks that define routes explicitly. So examples of that in Python would be like Flask or Django, where you have to explicitly specify every route. Or in Node.js, Express would be a good example where you're specifying the routes. And then in Ruby, Rails would be an example where you specify routes explicitly rather than just serving everything out of a folder. So in those frameworks, there's no implicit link between the URL and files in a folder. And so there's no risk of that Git directory getting exposed, even if it gets deployed to the web server. Okay, those frameworks, PHP and JSP, are actually kind of old and starting to fade out, but there's another common way these .git directories are getting exposed, which is becoming more popular, and that's through front-end single-page web applications. In static websites, you, you do. That's exactly what you do. You upload the whole directory. So um, often, there's a mistake made where they forget to omit the .git directory and they just upload the whole static site. And uh, yeah, the Git directory gets included in that. Because front-end developers 
often choose to spin up their own repositories to manage all that front end code. And it's designed to just be all public statically served as is. But if that .git directory accidentally leaks out in those situations, again, you could end up with a git credential that has write permissions to that website accidentally getting exposed. So what's the takeaway here? Well, first of all, we go into a lot more detail in the blog, both with regards to how to reproduce these findings and how to prevent it from happening in the first place. But second, I don't think this issue is likely to go away anytime soon. It's been around the last 10 years and I expect it to be around for the next 10 years. But what's changing are the types of credentials that are leaking out and how easy these credentials are to discover with new tools like Trufflehog. It's also interesting, the most commonly leaked credential from this research actually never lives in source code. It lives in a config file that never gets checked into version control. And so that just underscores the point that SaaS and cloud credentials often leak out a myriad of different ways that we're not expecting. And it's not just limited to source code.